Welcome back, everyone. We're here at theCUBE coverage in New York City. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We are at the NYSE. This is our East Coast studio, one of two we'll have here. We'll have the second largest footprint behind CNBC, between CNBC and theCUBE. No story will be missed. Of course, we've got Silicon Valley connecting Wall Street and Silicon Valley together, wall-to-wall -to -wall coverage. We've got RC in the house here. They've got a big event going on. Brian Benedict's co-founder and CRO of RC.ai. Big lunch presentation here, a lot of influence coming customers, really digging into the future of AI and how these language models and these foundation models are changing. It's not just the large, it's the small, it's the secure, it's the sovereign models, SLMs. Brian, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Oh, thanks for having me. So we love, we just talked before we came on, you guys got some nice pedigree in terms of backing. Um, you just guys getting going. The AI wave is probably going to be the, one of the most prolific investment areas across the board. I mean, I've never seen in my career since the 80s massive innovation on both the application front and the back end. It's a front end, back end, a parallel innovation cycle where you don't need to wait for the hardware right now. You can actually get into these domains yeah, and, and build out specific and horizontally scalable systems. And so you got almost the top engineers, you're seeing 10X engineers, 10X business productivity. So you're really seeing a step function. I mean, this is a generational thing and the excitement's off the charts. Um, confidence is a whole nother thing. So people are, are becoming more confident, but you know, you're starting to see people go, okay, I get it. But the good news is there's some low hanging fruit. So I want to get your thoughts on how you guys see um, the businesses and the, and the infrastructure moving and where the progression is on the models that are emerging and how fast do you see that accelerating into um, say applications, um, data models, how are people where are they now in terms of that journey? Because it's totally transformational, are some further than others? What's your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. What we've seen is the movement from internal use cases using large language models to start to move to external use cases, client facing, more top line revenue type applications. And how that's kind of transformed over time is, you've seen like the big closed source companies come out with their different boxes, people using those LLMs and then saying, I need to productionalize this. And how do I productionalize this at the cost and the scale of this? And that's really where SLMs, I think, started taking more of a form factor. If you actually look back at time at when ChatGPT4 launches, yeah. then all of a sudden, Gemma, Grok, all these companies start coming up with small models. Yeah. And it's like, why? Yeah. <laughs> and really, what, the, what it was for was because the cost and the efficiency loss was just too much. They needed a way to productionalize these use cases. Yeah. And then back to your point, how can we couple these models with agentic workflows yeah. so that we can actually completely yeah. automate these manual processes? Yeah. yeah, one of the things about that's interesting, and again, two years ago when we put out a power law, we saw that it wasn't just about the large language models and the large foundation models, and even proprietary versus open source, that was the big debate. Yep. Um, and okay, that's at the top of the power law, but as you go down that power law, you saw specialty models emerge. Absolutely. And they could be medium sized, but then you started to see domain specific yes. um, language models that were smaller, as hence the SLM, which we love. But these are very targeted the data sets. And so when you get into agentic systems, now fast forward today, I'm just even starting to see some of the analysts. I saw Alt Altimeter Capital wrote a thing about system of record. They're finally kind of coming in from where the market was a few years ago. But they're also, you start to see that thinking come into, if you have an end-to-end -end workflow, mm -hmm. the models, you can map a model to an end-to-end -end workflow. It doesn't have to be big. Right. It just has Absolutely. to match the workflow. Because automation needs trust and delegation to data that matches that, and you could actually engineer that. And this is where people are starting to see the value of SLMs. And I want to get your reaction to this because I'm not saying it's the it's the it's the total solution, but it's an area where people are getting wins. Absolutely. What's your thoughts on this, and and what evidence do you guys see? Do you need French poetry and rap music to make a model for insurance claims? Does no. it make your model better? Right. When you think about these yeah. domain-specific models, it's the yeah. data. And one of the biggest challenges companies have today is they can't bring their data into the models. Closed source providers, you can't actually merge your data. Fine-tuning is tilting your model to something specific, but it doesn't actually give you your data set. I'm a healthcare provider and I have specific acronyms that within my own healthcare. How am I going to do that? How are my employees going to know what this means yeah. when that data is in part? of a general model. Yeah. So when you think about- And it's also their intellectual property too. Absolutely, it's their own IP, they're not going to let that out. So when you think about that problem and the cause and effect of this, having domain specific models that actually can be spoken in the voice of that company is something really unique. And what's happening really with models today, and I know there's a perception of, if I'm building something small, it needs to be domain specific. Models have gotten so good 
pre-training is yeah. no longer needed. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what the... It's kind of trained already. It's trained already. So now it's all about post-training techniques. Yeah. After a train, the post-training techniques are really what focuses a domain-specific model to be better. Yeah. What do I mean by that? Model merging, spectrum, different types of distillation. Those are the trends that are actually taking the context of a large language model and bringing it down to small, but keeping the power yeah. of what that large language model can I mean, there's so much to unpack there because what you're yeah. talking about is making the model smarter by merging the data together in a, in a coherent way, and trustful yeah. way. Um, I would also throw out there that you know, distributed post-training implementations are going to be a big deal because Absolutely. you know you can't just take an NVIDIA, NVLink mon God box and post it to a computer vision camera on a light pole. Right. I mean, right. you're going you can need you're going to need to do inference. You need to do some maybe fine tuning or reinforced learning. Yes. I mean, these edge devices are throwing off data and consuming data. That's got to go back in the model. So you're starting to see the distributed nature of how the model's working. So this model interaction that you're bringing up is a huge point, and not a lot of people are talking about it. Explain more why that's important, and then what you guys see as solutions for people saying, "Hey, I know there's going to be a collision with these models." I got to get in front of it. So, yeah, and, and this is where model routing becomes is going to become a very trendy and hot topic. <laughs> and what is that, right? What is model routing? Yeah. So we've actually built a model router within our own framework that actually can route any question to a series of different models, whether it's specialized yeah. or general, to answer questions. And the models yeah. calculate and reason and talk to each other to formulate the right answer. Talk about the routing thing, because I think you know people, I mean, I've been saying that networking's moving up into the data layer. And yeah. you can get a routing, you think about Cisco, you think about like packets, but you're talking about you know, a, a model routing, um, because if I'm a data set and I'm an AI agent, for instance, or I'm an AI uh, piece of software, I got some data, I'm like, hmm, I might want to look at where I can get data. So I have two choices. I can audition and ask everyone for an answer or use some predictive capabilities to go in. So this idea of efficiency around those two approaches, I'm just, just putting that out there as an example. Absolutely. Okay, so that's just trade-offs there. If I do an audition, I got, I'm hitting every model. Absolutely. There's going to be traffic. Or if I say, hey, I actually know that Brian's the model I want to talk to because I have data that says in the past he's done some good things. Right. That's where this whole trust delegation comes in. Talk about, I mean, this is really in the weeds, but this is yeah, kind of is. highlights, <laughs> it highlights the importance of like understanding the architecture. Right, absolutely. And, and that's where people kind of miss that. No, they do, absolutely. I think there's two pieces people miss. One, it's the architecture, but two, it's, it's thinking that only generalized models can actually be the answers to these yeah. questions. And when you start putting models against specialized models, what we're finding is sometimes the specialized models are actually making yeah. the general models smarter. Yeah, I mean, that's the fusion. Right. So let, let's, let's back up a second, we'll get, then I'm going to get to what you guys do with the company because I think this yeah, is sure, super important because sure. this is really where the action is. Yeah, you guys absolutely. are right in the center of the action. Most people are like, hey, it's not my swim lane, I'm not the model guy, but I have a small model. So people don't know because they have a small model, do I have to get involved? And people want to start building models. You're seeing people build models all the time because they want to get in and start using AI. You're starting to see some you know, experimentation. Uh, people might see an innovation. It could be a business person or a data scientist, or even a business user who knows the knobs and buttons of an enterprise workflow saying, hey, I want to automate that. I want to, and I, I have the domain specific knowledge to do that. So right. How, how do you encourage people to do models? I mean, is it, and, and how do you advise companies saying, hey, it's okay to bring a lot of models to the party? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the great thing about small language models and the thing that we haven't talked about is cost, yeah. right? As you think of the big general models, they are running a very unprofitable business in terms of how they actually build and how they can scale these. SLMs are small and they're more cost effective. We define an SLM as anything between you know, 1B and 70B. That is something that can be trained within days couple of days, yeah. not weeks, not yeah. months, and what does that do? That shrinks your cost. Yeah. You can take more advantage of building more, more small language models. Your ROI isn't as high. <laughs> this isn't like yeah. I have to get 20 million of a return to actually make this model profitable. And that's really the big nuance difference. So my advice to anyone is start small. Start yeah. with a domain specific model yeah. on a very specific use case that can give you quick ROI. And then you yeah. can learn from that in terms of how you want to extend yourself. I mean, if they have clean data, just bring it to the table. Absolutely. Right? I mean, if you know the data is good, right. good data is good, right? We want to So let's talk about RC, what you guys are doing. Talk about where you guys are in your progression of the company. Obviously, you got some good back and got a good, good first round. Where are you guys on the product um, status? Give us the uh, inside the numbers of, of RC. Yeah, so. Um, you know, we started talking about small language models over a year ago yeah. when it wasn't popular at all. <laughs> I mean, and to your point, we were calling it small and specialized and secure, yeah. Yeah. All, the, all the yeses, right, yeah. in terms of the connotation. You know, our whole goal was we think companies should own their own models. 
We think yeah. ownership is a foundation. You have this data, you can't let this data leave. Yeah. We all know that, but yeah. also ownership is going to continue to be key. When you think about the IP of these companies yeah. later in life, yeah. right? They, they own this data, they lock this data down for years. Now they're gonna let their data out into a model. So when we started RC, we really focused on, let's build small language yeah. models that companies can own. Let's do all the training, everything went inside yeah. of their own four walls so that they can have yeah. you know, really specialized models that they own for domain yeah. specifics. As we've grown, our company has gone from domain specific models to even general small language models. So yeah. the models have become so good over time, our general models that are 70B in token size yeah. are outperforming yeah. some of the big close force And models. by the way, just a year and a half ago, that was a big model. Yeah. So the models, yeah. the, the efficiency in terms of cost per token, Absolutely. and then you know, all the costs are driving down Absolutely. And the value is kind of increasing. Exactly, exactly. And so we feel really the great part about where we are is small language models plus agentic workflows are now a combinational yeah. suit for companies to say, I can yeah. go and route and train and have my models all throughout my own enterprise and get, and get an efficient ROI. And do this all within weeks. This isn't a month, this isn't years yeah. in terms of getting something back. You know, what's interesting is, is that once people get a taste of the agentic vision and see kind of like they do like a rag implementation, wow, the search is a killer app. Hey, great, it's back. Right. Search has never left. Um, but, <laughs> you know, search in the enterprise has always been a hard nut to crack Absolutely. because of the, of, the, of the silo data set. So right. when you look at search, everyone goes, oh, wow, I get it. When Once that happens, the abstraction starts happening. Right. And then you see the data models start to shift. So you start to see this now enterprise-wide. Um, we, we talked about this early in the week, and then last week only uh, McKinsey wrote a, did a study, 1% of enterprises are actually even using AI right now. So it's yeah. a huge TAM. Right. And the AI is a dream scenario because they have workflows, they have domain-specific knowledge. Absolutely. They have the need for a private AI, which is basically code word for you know, their IP or their data. And so they, they have to figure out this data model. So how do you guys help customers do that? Give us an example of how people use you guys. How do you guys engage with customers? What are some of the use cases you're doing? And where what are they doing? When do, do they hit this use case and go, okay, low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And then does it open up, wow, I could actually have more value in the data. I might want to start preparing for Agentic. Then what happens next? Take us through the customer. Yeah, ironically, one of our first actual clients was an automotive, uh, luxury automotive manufacturer. They came to us with a really specific problem. Their cars are being sold all over the world. There aren't dealerships all over the world to actually service these vehicles. So what do they do? You have an, app, you have an issue with your vehicle. Yeah. You then go to your, you now have an app on your phone that can say, this light went on, what do I do? It now routes mm -hmm. your problem to an authorized mechanic of this vehicle yeah. within that zip code area, tells them the problem, but not only tells them the problem, helps them figure out how to fix it. Because again, these mechanics are working on specialized luxury vehicles. They don't have the expertise of they're not doing this every day. <laughs> it's not like you're working on a you know a, an auto manufacturer that has you know thousands and millions of cars in your in the backyard. So we were able to pretty much work a workflow to an auto mechanic, tell them exactly how to fix it, what parts they need, what they need to do to fix that issue, as well as help the customer figure out where and who the authorized dealer is, who the authorized mechanic is to actually go to. Yeah, so both sides got value. Both sides got value. The customer uh, satisfaction yeah. increased. The time to fix the vehicles actually yeah. decreased. So you're, this is a win-win for this yeah. luxury manufacturer. I mean, just dialing up and trying to figure out where to go is one problem for the customer. Right. And then you got to go to the wrong location. Then the mechanic's like, well, it's going to be like 10 weeks to get the part right. or whatever. The, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit over the top, but that's the, that's the oh, lag. 100%. 100%. So you, you literally would have, here's the equipment you need for the, for the uh, mechanic. Here's how to actually fix it. All of their, all of their um, you know, mechanic law, mm -hmm. all of their mechanisms, all of their supply chain, everything yeah. was actually downloaded into these models for them to kind of configure. And I'm like, everyone should be doing this. Okay, as, as someone who's leading the go-to-market and your team, as you guys grow, what is the biggest uh, um, identified use case you can, you can see? And then what are some of the objections that you get and then how do you overcome them? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a common misconception of small language models in general. Yeah. I hear all the time, small language models can only deal with one use case. You can't load more than one use case of data in it. Not true. Not true, yeah. Small language models can't do multi-language. You can only load one language. Like, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. Small yeah. language models can't do reasoning. And yeah. that's not true. Like, the power of small language models have come so far in such a short period of time. Yeah. You can do these different things. And, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the most common use cases, I'll tell you one that's been coming up quite a bit. It's really matchmaking. Yeah. So what I mean by matchmaking is, can you actually find the people that match a descriptor 
to some degree. Yeah. So there's companies that we're working with that are doing this on a networking basis. There's companies internally that are doing this. Like one I can talk about publicly is Guild. Guild is Guild Education is a company yeah. in which they match up people with their career uh, advancement uh, co uh, courses. Yeah. And so when they worked with RC, we built a small language model for them. Instead of talking to live people, yeah. they said the people came back and said the answers are at a 97% on par or yeah. better than talking to an actual person yeah. and getting the courses that they need to complete yeah. to actually continue their I mean, education. this is clearly going to be like what IT used to be like. I'm serving the business. This small language model combination, power law, whatever you want to look at it, abstraction layer will be the foundation. SLMs will be the foundational element for agents. I agree. Because with Salesforce this year, Dreamforce, where they launched Agent Force, you know, even Salesforce, they, I mean, they're going to be just, they're, they're in an enterprise, but they're not running everything. Right. But they're building agents. And when we sat down with their team and did a deep dive with the technical team, they're all like, hey, you know, look, there's going to be sub-agents right. and agents. And by the way, we have to harmonize across our silos. And so they are actually fixing a problem that they've been trying for decades to fix. If you know Salesforce out right. there, you, yeah. we all know they bought a Slack, they bought a bunch of companies. True. And now, they, in the first time in their history, they can actually harmonize the data sets to prepare for agents and sub-agents. Right. Now, once they do that, okay, they're now set up for, for uh, growth. I'm more bullish on Salesforce than others think they're going to get replicated by AI. I think they're going to actually do well because they got the data. I agree. Uh, Salesforce yeah. has got the data, so I'm, I'm bullish on Salesforce. Now, Salesforce also has to talk to their customers. So let's take an example. AWS partners with Salesforce. Well, guess what? If I'm a customer, I'm using the cloud. I got stuff on premise, I'm training, right. and we use Salesforce. Right. Well, their agent's going to talk to my agents. I feel like, a, like hey, have your agent call my agent, exactly. make a movie. You know, I mean, this is where it's going. No, it is. You're 100% so, right. So your thesis around small language models talking to each other and, and you know, getting in the weeds on, on model routing is real. Oh, yeah. And so with all that being said, okay, that's coming. It's not yet here. But if you connect the dots, you have to look at, okay, what's the value extraction? What am I unlocking? Right. Is that going to drive revenue or cost efficiency? You mentioned that. Absolutely. And then two, does that revenue line exceed the cost line. 100%. Because if you throw money at it and the red line doesn't cross the black line, as they say in business school, you're screwed. Yep. So the red, <laughs> the time, black and red. So this is where you see like people looking at open AI and they're, whoa, they're losing so much money. And I think that a lot of people jump to conclusions that SLMs will follow the open AI economics. Right. And so I want to get your thoughts on this because I'm sure you are pro, not, not the case, but that comes up a lot for people who aren't in, in the enterprise. They go, whoa, what's going to cause is, what's my CapEx requirement? Yeah. Address the issue of why this is a little bit more efficient oh. to go down this path versus, whoa, I, I don't want to get over my skis. Yeah. I have no idea what the, the CPU charge is going to be. Well, you might not need CPUs yeah. or GPUs. I, no, I mean, I think you actually just hit the nail on the head. A lot of times you can run these on CPUs, more cost efficiencies. The inference cost is much less. The overall compute cost is much less. And we have clients that are running in their own environments for less than five figures for a full year of running an SLM. Less than five yeah, figures, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking like single thousand digit yeah. dollars to run models. And when you think about that, yeah. and you think about the efficiency gains that you're gaining from that, how can you not how can you not yeah. take a chance at, at working and running some of these? You know, one of the things I get asked a lot on theCUBE, because, you know, is, is, hey, you know, you live through multiple cycles. Is this the dot-com bubble bursting? Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, it feels like everyone compares, and I, I do, I think it's all, the chat GPT felt like the web because it's a front end, right. front end innovation. Sure. And I said, yeah, but it's not that because this value being extracted, the back end is growing too. So it's more like the PC revolution right. and PC server revolution where, hey, there's going to be more infrastructure advancements and the apps will ride that wave with it. But what's different is there's no lag between the processing power and the application rollout because it's not a waterfall methodology. So what's happening now is you have app innovation right. at, in domains where in entrepreneurs are digging in, hence the frenzy in the developer community and the back end. Right. At the same time, I've never seen this right. in my career. So it's usually been back end, cloud was back end, web was front end, mobile was front end. But, okay. but now entrepreneurs are digging in, getting value because a lot of these workflows are so obvious. Right. And That's there's true. value unlocking because they have the data. And so I want to get your thoughts as we kind of wrap this up, is that if I have data, I have value. You believe in that premise. Oh, 100%. Okay, Absolutely. So, so that's every company. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. There we are. Okay. So <laughs> what do you guys advise them to do? Because right now, there's like, do I hire a firm? Um, and again, you know, the old models back in the days, I'll hire a big 
a consulting firm. They'll come in, sure. give me your watch, I'll tell you what time it is. <laughs> um, and next thing you know, six months in, where are you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. every company needs to make their best educated guess based on the personnel they have. I mean, yeah. you have some companies that have very strong yeah. AI teams and departments that are able to kind of take on more, yeah. and you have some that just don't. And I think it really is a little, you know, a little bit of a cop out answer. I get it, but I think it really yeah. is. It really does depend. I would say this though, I tell companies all the time, start with an SLM that will give you instant value, yeah. and if and you have to look at kind of the overall you know, risk tolerance yeah. of your company to say, is it easier to do something more manually, a, a manual yeah. internal type of solution or something external? Yeah. I mean, I think ServiceNow is kind of leading the charge of showing people, look what we can do in terms of driving profitability when we get it right. Yeah. And I love the fact that we've got companies like that leading the charge, showcasing that to your point, this isn't a yeah. bubble. People are actually in intrinsically driving profitability, driving their highest, you know, stock prices that they've had mm -hmm. in years yeah. based on these innovations, so. Brian, let me ask you to wrap up. Um, the question that's on my mind and probably people watching, when do I call RC up? What are my pain points? How do I engage with you? What do you offer? What, what, what do I look at in my environment saying, I need to call you guys? Yeah. What's that pitch? What's that value proposition? Not so much pitch, but what's the value proposition that people can align with? Usually it's some sort of either pain point or growth yeah. opportunity. What's the, what's the, uh, I mean, I think wherever you are on your AI journey, we've got something for you, whether it's, you know, general models that you want to use that in your environment and you care about security and you care about ownership, we've got you. If you're looking at more domain specific models and you have a use case, a lot of times our clients come from, I've used a sandbox closed source model and I want to scale and I want to productionalize. Those are great places to come. And to you guys come us. in and you build the models for them, you mentor them through it, is it service and platform, what's it's, the dynamic? It's really either or, depending on their team, so we have a platform that they can use to actually do that yeah. work, or we can actually be yeah, yeah. You know, a support mechanism for them on that. It's interesting, I want, to, I want one more question before you go, because this has come up. We're seeing that in the old school VC days in Silicon Valley, um, when I, it was, if, if anything was professional services, I mean, Sequoia recognized that professional services drives market, go to market, and primes the pump. Sure. But now with AI and platform leverage, the ec software economics are coming into professional services. You're starting to see good professional services entrepreneurs go, hey, I can actually grow my professional services with a 10X by applying software economics and yep. operating leverage on scale right. and get escape velocity that looks like software platform Absolutely. with professional, so I don't have to have this, well, I'm doing professional services to get the business going because AI has a lot of professional services now, but when the platform comes in, it's still that human in the loop. Can you talk about how you see that? Do you agree with that and are you seeing that? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing less and less of that on our side because we, you know, pretty much like up front, there's a little bit of work to be doing, but we've automated so much of this process with workflows and with their data and with the routing systems that we have that, you know, as you kind of, you know, like any business, I think when you start up, you know, you want to get be more hands on up front, do some more services and then figure out how to automate. We've done a lot of that over the past year. So you guys are more of get, get that up and running and pass the keys off and let them drive their AI. Abs absolutely. Versus absolutely. Professional yeah. services like a consulting organization. Yeah, we don't really get too involved on yeah. the ongoing basis. A lot of times, yeah. like you know, there's retrains and different things where people have we've yeah, automated yeah. without the process. I mean, there's some support, but it's not the yes, primary revenue driver. No, not it's at not consultant-led no, growth. Not it's all. consultant selling. Yes. To get up and running. Absolutely. It's the classic, hey, you're, you can drive now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know what, that's yeah. what these enterprises yeah. want too. They want to feel yeah. like, again, they have control yeah. and they have ownership, so. And where do you guys win? What's the, uh, when you guys win deals, what's the reason why you win deals? I would say the biggest key factor is ownership. When we talk to people about ownership, yeah. that's something not many companies yeah. can actually you know, discuss with them. It's most solutions you're renting. Yeah. You're renting your tools from other people, and we're yeah. providing them the ability to say, this is your yeah. model, you own it, yeah. it lives with you in your I mean, own walls. So. You guys got a great formula. Assets and workflows, the new IP, yeah. and they go together. Absolutely. Yes. Data is great, but workflows are just as good too, because you're automating those. It has to be. Yeah. And All right, well, thanks for coming in. Real quick, you got the presentation uh, at the NYSE. Yes. Uh, what are you going to talk about? Well, it's going to definitely be a lot around small language models. <laughs> I know that's a surprise, but you know some really yeah. uh, some interesting fun facts. I'm going to debunk a lot of myths hopefully today Good. and get people uh, eyes open a little bit more. On All right, we'll, the we'll, small we'll keep in touch. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for coming on the Cube and being part of the Cube Network NYC Wired. I'm John Furrier, host of Cube. This is our new East Coast location. We're in Palo Alto on Silicon Valley, connecting Silicon Valley and Wall Street, creating a, a network of experts and, and friends, probably changing the AI. These are the AI leaders on the East Coast here. Thanks for watching.